Hi there. So today I'm going to show you how to build and deploy a Node.js application in less than 30 minutes. But before we get started with that, a little bit about me. My name is Dwayne Bester. I've been doing software for the last 10 years at various different startups. Um, I've done virtual reality, little IMU sensors, done custom wireless protocols, a lot of Bluetooth type stuff, all the way up to big PR analytics data where we're ingesting 100,000 articles a day and storing them in a massive 80 node Elasticsearch cluster um, in Amazon Cloud. So this has afforded me kind of a lot of exposure um, to many different software languages and frameworks. So anything from like C to Java, Scala, Clojure, a lot of JavaScript, um, and then even some languages that are in beta like Unison. But today we're just gonna be sticking to something very practical. Um, say you have a bunch of IoT devices and they're sending up data and you need to aggregate that data and store it in a database and then be able to query that data back. Um, how do we get there and how do we get there very quickly? Well, that's what this course is about. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have some goals. We're gonna use Docker to set up a local database um, where they're gonna build a very simple RESTful API with Node that will accept some sort of data from an IoT device and will also be able to return a list of that data. We'll then write some tests for the application. We will push that application to GitHub, which is a code repository, and then we will deploy that to DigitalOcean Cloud with just a few button clicks. Um, for the more visual learners, this is the application diagram, an IoT device posting data to the Node app, storing that in Postgres, um, and then our Node application will also be able to send that data back to like a browser, for example. So some tools and some setups that we're gonna learn today. Um, we're gonna create a DigitalOcean account. We're gonna download and install Docker, Node. Um, we're gonna install Git. We'll have to create a GitHub account if you don't already have one. We'll go through some terminal and project scaffolding. Um, we'll install Visual Studio Code and we will use the command line utility curl. So with that, let's get started. Hi there and welcome. So. In order to get started, we have to download a bunch of different tools and create a few user accounts. So let's do that right now. The first one we're gonna download is Docker. So go ahead and go to docker.com and then click get started. We'll scroll down and we're gonna download Docker desktop. Um, I'm gonna download and install for Mac, but choose your operating system. So go ahead and download and install that right now. Okay. The next thing we need to install is Git. So if you open up your terminal, and if you don't have your terminal there, you can click Go, Utilities, and then Terminal, and open your terminal app. And once you're in your terminal, um, you can just type git dash dash version, and it should spit out a version number. If this doesn't happen for you, if you don't have Git installed, go ahead and go to git dash sem.com and then click download for your operating system and it'll give you a few different options or methods on how to install. So basically you can install via Homebrew or with Xcode or just download the installer. So go ahead and download and install Git right now. After Git, we need to make sure that we have Node and NPM installed. So if you go to your terminal again and you type node-b, it should spit out a version. Um, similarly with NPM, should spit out a version as well. And these two usually come bundled together. So if you install Node, you should have NPM as well. If you do not have this installed, go ahead and go to nodejs.org and just download the LTS uh, long-term support version and install that on your machine. Let's do that now. Okay. after. Node.js, we are going to want to install Visual Studio Code. If you don't have it, please go to code.visualstudio.com and click the download for your operating system. Go ahead and download and install that now. After installing Visual Studio Code, <clears throat> we're going to want to go and create a GitHub account. So if you don't already have a GitHub account, go to github.com and sign up. I'm just going to sign in as I already have an account and it should eventually take you to a dashboard that looks something like this. Okay, after creating a GitHub account, we're gonna go create another account on DigitalOcean. So if you just go to digitalocean.com and sign up, 
or sign in if you have an account. I already have one, so I'm going to sign in. And once you have signed in, let's go ahead and navigate to apps on the left hand side and then launch your app. We'll see here it has a place to link your GitHub account. So we will do the GitHub account and create a Git repo um, very shortly. Okay, so we have all the tools and accounts um, set up. So let's go ahead and open our terminal. And remember, if you don't have it in your menu, you can click Go, Utilities, and then Terminal, and you can open it. When the terminal opens, it will open to your user directory. So if I, if you type pwd, that's the directory that you're in. ls lists all the directories in that directory. So you see here I have applications, desktop, downloads, documents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's go ahead and make a directory for all of our coding projects called projects. We'll then cd change directory into projects. Uh, now if we list, there should be nothing in here. Let's go ahead and make a folder for our actual little API. So make there again, data dash API. Cool. Now we will change into data API and we should see that there's nothing in data API. Um, now we can use NPM, which we downloaded and installed with Node to create kind of like a very basic NPM Node project. Let's type npm init dash y inside of this directory and it will go ahead and create a package.json file with this information. It's just kind of like default information. Um, you know, you'll see it has your author, your license, a main file which doesn't exist yet, description, and a version. Um, at this point, we can go ahead and open Visual Studio Code. So go ahead and open that. It should bring you to a welcome page. You can just close that, file, open. We can navigate to our project's data API folder and open the data API folder. We can close the welcome page and open package.json. So see here it says main and points to that index.js file. Let's go ahead and right click make new file and call it index.js. We won't worry about putting anything in it just yet. Um, one more thing, let's go ahead and click terminal, new terminal. This is just nice to have a terminal inside of VS Code. Um, just makes things a little bit easier. So it's all on one screen and we can see everything. So now that we have a terminal inside of VS Code with the scaffolding of the project up, let's go ahead and, I don't know, just install our main dependency express. So npm i for install express. What this will do is it will reach out to the internet, grab express and all of its dependencies and place them inside of this node modules directory. So don't worry about the node modules directory. It's just going to basically have a bunch of code that other people wrote that we can leverage. At this point, we have the very basics of our project set up. Um, what we'll do next is we'll go into some API design and think about what we actually want to accomplish with this API, and then we will start writing code. All right, let's discuss some API design. We have IoT devices that are posting temperature data to our server, and then our server is going to store that data in Postgres database. It'll also provide means to query that data if we wanted to see all the data inside of the database. Um, inside that node app, it's the node app, it's, it's basically a virtual machine that's running this node instance, right? Um, and exposes port 80 to our application because HTTP requests usually come in on port 80. And so our node application will have to implement all this HTTP server code. Luckily for us, there's a library out there called Express that gives us some handy functions to build this API. Um, so we'll be using Express. A RESTful API really usually consists of three things, um, a method and then a request endpoint or path and then the body, AKA like, you know, the data. Um, and then methods are usually get, put, post, and delete, where a get is for like, you wanna get data from the server, you wanna read data, you wanna query. Um, a put is for updating, so you put data to the server to update something in the server. 
posting is for creating and deleting is for deleting. And then the URL endpoints or the past, they represent the domain model, right? So all users might be slash API slash users that that will give all the users, right? Um, but the address of the user with ID is five is like you go to your API, then your users, the user with ID five, and then their address. So it has that cascade down effect. Um, and then data itself is usually JSON, which stands for JavaScript object notation. Um, and it has the format like squiggly bracket and then key value, key value. Um, values themselves can be objects or arrays. A very, very, very simple JSON object that might represent a user is this one where, you know, name is Dwayne and age is 30. Uh, when you combine all three of these is kind of where you get this restfulness. Um, adding a user, you'd say like data is equal to the sum JSON data, and you post that data to slash users. Um, getting users is where you do a get request to slash API slash users. Getting user by ID is like, you know, a get request to slash API user by ID, the ID number. And that should return just a singular user. So let's think about our API. Um, our pretend IoT device is going to have a serial number, a temperature reading, and a name. So it might look something like this name break room serial number some serial number and then a temperature reading and so our rest api if we want to send new data to our server for it to store it's going to be a post and so the data might look something like this and then we would post that to slash api slash data uh, if we want to query all the data from a server we would do a get from slash api slash data and it might return an array of a bunch of these json objects that will have the name the serial and the temperature so with this in mind, let's jump into the code and start building this API. All right, so now that we have a very high level understanding of a RESTful API, let's just go ahead and go into the software and a lot more of that RESTful stuff will make sense at this point. So we have Express dependency installed. Let's go ahead and require that now. So we do so by calling const express equals require express. The next thing we want to do is we want to invoke express to give us an actual application. So let's do const app equals express. The parentheses mean we are invoking express. And let's create our first route. So what we will do is we will just do get slash hello. And then we will pass in a request and a response into this anonymous Lambda function. Don't worry, it'll make sense. So the request is the request in Express is the HTTP request coming in and the response is the HTTP request being sent back. Uh, so right now we really only care about telling the response something. Um, so let's go ahead and do res.status200. 200 is HTTP speak for good. Um, and then we will send hello back. And then we can return. So now we have defined a get to a slash, a get request to a slash hello endpoint. Let's go ahead and start our app. We do app.listen. We pass in an object with the port set to 8080. And then we want the callback function to let us know that the server is running. So we just console log server is running. Okay, so that that is pretty much all we need to get a very basic HTTP RESTful API server up and running. Uh, in your terminal, go ahead and type node index.js and we see that we have server is running. Now, if you opened your browser and you went to localhost colon 8080, you see that we have express running. Something comes back to us, but we cannot get slash. Remember we did slash hello. And we see that it sent us back hello. If we go ahead and control C, command C this, and we decide to say 
something else, like return there. We then rerun our index.js. We see server is running. We go back to our browser, refresh, and we see that it's been updated. Perfect. So at this point, we have the very bare bones of a RESTful API server written in Node. All right. And for the next part, let's go ahead and basically, instead of just having a get that just sends data out that something can just query, let's, um, let's do a post that allows us to create new data. And let's get away with hello in there. Let's start actually doing some data. Um, so now that we have this app object has a bunch of different cool things you could do. Um, but to basically tell Express, hey, we're going to be sending JSON. Um, let's do app.use express.json and then invoke it. So now this will basically tell Express, hey, we're going to be sending JSON. And it does some things behind the scenes. Uh, and let's also create a data list to basically house just a bunch of data that we're going to randomly send this API. So let's say data list and set it equal to an empty array. Let's change this from hello to slash data. And what we're going to do is instead of sending a string, we're going to we're going to send the data list. This is not best practice, but since Node.js is single threaded, we're not going to worry about multiple things trying to access this data list at one time. Um, so once we get to the database part, we won't have this. But just for now, let's see. Let's see what happens. So let's go ahead and copy this get and make make a post. So now when we post the slash data, we will actually add whatever data to the data list. So we could say data list dot um, push. And then remember the body of the HTTP request is the data. So rec dot um, body. And what we can actually do to be more explicit about it is we could say we let data equals rec dot body. And then we push the data. Okay, just so super explicit. Um, and on the post, you usually send back a 201 when something has been created. Um, and we can actually just send back the data that we've added to the list back to whoever is adding the data. Um, cool. So we've told Express to use JSON. We have a data list. We have a get data and a post data for querying and for creating. And then we have the app.listen. So let's go ahead and run node index.js. We see server is running. If you click this icon in Visual Studio Code, it actually brings up a separate terminal, um, which is super nice because we can do stuff still within our same environment. Um, if we go really quick to the browser and we go to slash data now, we see that it has the empty array as data list is currently empty. Um, if we decide that we want to add some sort of data, we can just use curl, super handy command line utility. And we're going to add just a very dumb name, Dwayne piece of uh, JSON data. And so you do curl dash D is for the data flag. And you're going to want to post it to localhost 8080 slash data. So HTTP localhost 8080 slash data. Cool. So we noticed that it just printed out an empty object. And this is very important. If we go back over here and hit refresh, we see that it just has an empty JSON object, but we sent name Dwayne. So what What's going on here? Well, because of that express JSON, we we basically need to tell express on the sending of the data that, hey, this is JSON data, and it's OK to trust that. So in our curl, we're going to put dash h. We're going to add a header. And we're just going to say the content type of this data is JSON. So we can do content dash type colon application slash JSON. And now we see that when we send that, we get an actual name Dwayne response back because we're sending 
we're sending that back to the client on the actual adding of the data. If we go to our browser and refresh, we have that bad object that we sent and then the actual working object. Um, so our data list has two datums in it. Um, let's go ahead and add a different name. So we're going to say Martin um, gets to join the club. And so we go over here and switch to our browser. And now we have the bad object and then the two good ones. So this is pretty cool because now you have a way to query your HTTP API and get some sort of data and you have a way to send data to it. Um, we're just using curl right now to send the data to it. Um, in the next video, we will be making some up updates to this and we will be adding Docker to spin up a database locally and then connect this little application to that database. Before we get into Dockerizing our API, let's go ahead and install a tool that will make our lives a little bit easier. Right now, whenever we uh, change some code, we have to restart our server for those changes to take effect. So we have to do uh, node index.js to start the server. Um, we want to make a change to something over here. Um, you press save, the server doesn't automatically restart, doesn't pick up those changes. You have to um, command C and then rerun the command and now it'll pick up this change. So there's a tool out there called nodemon um, that will help. So let's go ahead and install that now. Um, npmi nodemon. And right before nodemon, we're going to do dash capital D. And this will install this as a uh, dependency, uh, for a dev dependency. So not like we don't need this for production, just for development. And if we go into our package.json and we add a new um, command here called um, dev, so dev, and we can make make it um, nodemon, and then index.js. Okay, so we've installed nodemon, and if we run npm run dev. It, you see that it spits out nodemon index.js and then server is running and to restart anytime press rs we don't need to do that but now if we go make a change and hit save see it automatically restarted our server <clears throat> so this is super handy for development um, because we don't have to stop and start that every time so let's get started at dockerizing our application Let's make a new file and call it a uh, Docker file. And let's go ahead and make a another new file and call it dot um, docker ignore. So a period and then docker ignore, one word. And this docker ignore file, it's just when we copy a bunch of our code into this Docker container, we don't want to copy all of these node modules. Um, so let's go ahead and in this docker ignore file type node modules <clears throat> with a slash, save it. We can close that and forget about it. All right. Now the actual docker file, um, what we're going to do is we're going to basically pull a base node image. Um, so what we can do is we can do node <clears throat> and then 14 dash alpine and it's just a very slim node container. Um, and what we're going to do then is we're going to set our working directory to slash app. And then we're going to copy all of our code um, from this directory that we're in the data API directory into the work directory that we're in in the Docker container. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to install, run the install command to install all the uh, dependencies. So run npm install and we want to do dash dash production and then we are going to expose um, the port so we know that the port is 8080 and and that's it that is all we need for our docker file so it will basically use a super slim node 14 image sets our working directory to app copies our code in there 
installs all the dependencies that we need and then exposes port 8080. Uh, we're not going to run any commands to start anything yet. Um, we can do that later on uh, once we're in the cloud. There is one more thing we need to do. Let's go ahead and do a new file and call it docker-compose.yml, which is a YAML file, so docker compose YAML. And we are going to use docker compose to bring up a Postgres database for our development environment to talk to locally. And for that, there's a couple things we need. YAML files are very strict with their formatting, so just try to copy this um, using the exact same tabs and spacing that, that I'm using right now. So let's set the, the version to um, a string of 3.8. And then we're going to set services. Um, we're going to have one service called DB, which is the database. Um, and that will be an image where we are going to pull down the base Postgres 12 image. So you just do Postgres 12. Um, and then we're going to set some environment parameters. So for environment, we need, we need basically like the, the database name, the username and the password. So let's do uh, Postgres DB. We'll set that to be called DB. Um, we want the user. Uh, let's just call that user. Whoops. And then the password. This one is really um, the most important one. Postgres password. And we're going to just set that to be password. OK, just like so. Um, the last thing we need is to expose the port um, that Postgres runs upon. So let's do ports. Um, a dash, and then we're going to map the default part port that Postgres starts up to the default port um, that it should be. So we can do a string here, 5432, colon 5432. All right. And so that, that should be it. Um, we have our main Docker file that we'll use when we deploy to the cloud. And then we'll use this Docker Compose uh, locally to bring up a database. So now that we have this, if we go into our terminal and we type docker compose and then up dash D, it should, it should bring up um, this database. So if we open doc, docker desktop, we see that we have data API running and underneath is just this Postgres 12 image. Uh, it might be hard to see on the screen. But basically, you see a bunch of logging out, and then it says at the very bottom, uh, database system is ready to accept connections. So that's fantastic. That's exactly what we need uh, to get started. So at this point, we have Docker Compose running that will set up a Postgres database locally. Um, now what we can do is we can connect our application to that database. For that, we will need a couple more dependencies. Um, we will need SQLize and the node Postgres dependency. So let's install those now. npm i pg and then SQLize, like so. We'll go ahead and install those. Um, we see that it adds those to, to our dependencies. We can then go into our index.js um, and we can import SQLize right after um, we can require SQLize right after uh, requiring express. So let's do a const and then squiggly bracket uh, SQLize equals require SQLize. And so these, these brackets here, they basically, we can import SQLize just like express and then we'll be able to say like SQLize dot capital SQLize to access it. This is just a shortcut way of um, grabbing that sub property from, from this package. Um, so now what we can do is um, before creating our express app, let's go ahead and create an actual like SQLize instance. So lowercase SQLize equals new capital SQLize. 
and we're going to pass in um, our Postgres uh, environment variable. So that's going to be an environment variable like so. So we can just do uh, process dot env dot uh, data base underscore URL. And then we will also pass in the separate options over here. Um, and we will set a dialect to Postgres. So <clears throat> at this at this point, we don't have this database URL uh, being passed into our application. Um, so let's go ahead and do that now. If we go to package.json, scroll up, and we go to this dev, let's set that equal to um, to what we know the defaults are. So the Docker Compose, we have the database is DB, the user is user, and the password is password. So let's say the user, let's set the URL to be Postgres, um, colon slash slash, and then, um, just get my notes. Okay. User column password. And then at, uh, we don't need to put localhost um, colon 5432 for the port because those are the defaults. Um, so really all we need is just to do a colon slash DB. And so this is a shorthand URL. This will basically automatically pick up localhost and the port 5432 and then this uh, database. So it just shortens our little URL. So this database URL is now going to be passed in um, as this process environment variable. And so this SQLize should now have access to that. In the app.listen, um, let's go ahead and do a try catch. So what we're going to try to do is a SQLize.authenticate. And if that worked, we can just um, print out to the console Yes, we connected to the to the database. So console.log connected to database. Um, and then we need to throw we need to add a catch. So go ahead and do a catch error like so. And then we will basically just say we could not um, connect to the database. And then we will also print out the error. So just do a comma and then error. And so that should print that out to the console. So when the Express app starts up, we will try to connect to the database. And if that works, we will see connected to the database. And if we don't, we would see not, could not connect to the database. All right. And with that, we can run our npm run dev command. And we see that it spits out connected to database and it executed a select one plus one as a result. That's just in like a super easy way to send some SQL to the database and get a response and make sure that it works. So at this point, we have connected our node application to our local running database. In this next section, we are going to um, create a model for our sensor data and that model will allow us to save data to the database and query data from the database. So let's do that now. We're going to make const uh, sensor data equal new um, equals sqlize dot define. And the first argument to define is the model name. So we can just make it sensor dash data. And this will correspond um, to the table name in Postgres. Then we do an, um, an options, and basically we're passing in now the fields of the database or the fields of our model. And we know our JSON model is going to have a, um, a serial. And so we will set serial to type um, data types dot string. And allow null is false because we do not want this to be null at all. Add a comma. And then for me, it automatically imported this data types. Um, so on line number two here, add comma data types um, to the require. Then we can copy serial and make one for name. And then we can do a third one and make it for temperature. But the type of the temperature is not a string. It's a number. It's a decimal number. So 
let's go ahead and make that a float. So now we have this sensor data um, object that basically represents our Postgres table for sensor data. Uh, right now, what we could do is when we do the database authentication, so we make sure we can connect to the database, let's go ahead and do a sync. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to pass in an object here with a alter um, set to true. And so this will tell SQLize to alter the tables to match our sensor data model. Um, so we can just say like, you know, synchronize the database and then hit save. And now we see a bunch of SQL data being spit out when once we've saved that. And also we should see um, connected to database, sync to database, and then server is running. So, so with that, we should now, we can now, instead of using this data list, we can now actually um, query the database. So on the, in the post, let's do const uh, sensor data equals SQLize, oh, I'm sorry, uh, capital sensor data dot um, create. And we can pass in the data which comes from the request body. And then we can, once we have this, we can basically send that back to the client. Um, this, if we save this, this won't work. Um, this sensor data dot create, it's basically creating stuff in the database. It returns a promise. So we need to add an await in front and we need to make our function an async function, uh, function for this, for this to work. So if we do async and then await, um, this should now be totally fine. Uh, for getting all the data, we can copy that line and instead of calling it sensor data, let's just call it, I don't know, all data. And we want to do sensor data dot find all with nothing passed in. And we can just send that all that data back to the client. And remember, it's now failing because we need an async um, function to be able to handle this await. So now what we have is no data list. Um, and async functions for the get and the post. And we're now basically querying that model, which directly um, relates to the Postgres table. If we go to our browser and we refresh, we see that we have no data in that database, um, which is fine. Let's go ahead and open up that second console, a uh, second terminal console. Some people call it a console. And let's go ahead and use curl to add some data. So curl dash D single quote, squiggly bracket, double quote. Um, we're going to just call the name of this piece of data uh, break room. And then let's set the serial to um, a string of 001 or something like that. And then temperature. Let's just make it like, I don't know, the break room's Break room is a good temperature, 73.01 degrees. Close the squiggly bracket, close the single quote, and then we need to add our application JSON header. So dash capital H, single quote, content dash type, colon, and then application forward slash JSON. And then we can close that with a single quote, and then double quotes again, HTTP, local host port 8080 slash data. So we're curling, we're posting this bit of JSON data. We're set, setting a header saying it is JSON um, to our local host 8080 slash data. We hit enter um, and we see that we get back a bunch of stuff. Let's go ahead and do another one, but I don't know, make the temperature something else. Instead of 73, let's say, the temperature increased a little bit. It's now 73.24, and we send that. We can now go ahead and go to our browser, refresh on this get request, and then we see that we have two pieces of data returned to us. Um, they will SQLize automatically adds IDs and create it at and update it at timestamps, which is super handy because we can basically do filtering and ordering on that created at timestamp. So very handy. Um, so at this point, we have all the pieces connected of a functioning API. 
um, we can save stuff to the database and we can query stuff from a database and we can serve that via our node app as a RESTful API. So congratulations on getting this far. Um, in the next couple of videos, we will take this a few steps further. Um, we will deploy this to the cloud. And then I have some optional videos after that of hardening the API, testing it, and um, just generally making it more secure. So let's go on to the next video. In this next section, we are going to use Git and GitHub and create a Git repo locally, push our code up to GitHub, um, and then after that, we will deploy it to the cloud using DigitalOcean and GitHub's integration. So we can stop our server from running if it's not already. And there's just there's just a couple things we need to change in order to get it to work within the DigitalOcean sphere. Um, so go ahead and add a dialect options um, object to the SQLize. And what we're going to do is we're going to do an SSL. And we're going to set the um, require to true and then reject unauthorized uh, to false. And so this will just basically um, allow this to work because it's in DigitalOcean's cloud and their Postgres database will have SSL um, turned on. And so we just want to make sure we re require that. And then if we have an unauthorized certificate, which we will because we will be using a self-signed one um, automatically, then we don't want we want that to not be rejected. So go ahead and just add these options in. Um, w these options will will not work um, with the local database. So we can go ahead and run uh, Docker compose down, and this will just basically shut down that database that's running locally. Um, okay, so. The next thing to do is in the terminal, we type git init, and we see that it initialized an empty re repository um, right here, and all of our files changed to be green. We can go ahead and create a new file, call it .git ignore, so period, git ignore, one word. And same thing, we don't want these node module dependencies to be pushed up to GitHub. So let's just go ahead and do node underscore modules slash save it. Cool. And so that should be good for that. If we now go to our browser and we go to GitHub, let's go ahead and create a new repository. Click the plus sign, new repository. I'm going to name mine the same thing, data dash API. Um, I'm leaving mine public and I'm not adding any of these files yet. Um, don't worry about doing that right now. We're going to do that in uh, Visual Studio Code. So click Create Repo. And it, it might take some time depending on how GitHub is feeling that day. Um, so then it comes up and it says, you quick setup. Um, we've already done git init. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code and add that readme file. So just new right click new file, um, readme.md. And then readmes are usually there to kind of give other software engineers, other software developers an understanding of what your code is doing. Um, right now, we're just going to keep this very small. Um, and so we'll basically add something in there saying, um, you know, collects data from IoT temperature devices. And then we can update that later, but that should be fine for now. Um, if we go back to our browser, we can go ahead and basically add all our files and then create our first commit. So if you type git status, it will tell you what the status of your repo is. So we're on our branch, we're on the master branch, we have no commits yet, and all these files are untracked. Um, so go ahead and let's just add all of them. So git add dash dash all. And now if we do git status, we see that these files are in green, um, but not ready to be committed yet. So let's do that git commit. So git commit dash m, and then just say an, a message of initial commit. Whenever you commit, it's basically like whatever changes you have made. Um, but this is our initial commit, so that should be okay. And now if we do a git status again, we see that there's nothing left to commit. We're on the master branch. 
Um, one thing GitHub will tell us is a good idea is to rename our branch from master to main. So let's go ahead and do that now. So git branch dash capital M main. And now we see that it switched our branch to main. And then we can go ahead and add the origin, which is this um, GitHub repo inside the cloud, inside GitHub's own cloud. Um, so we can just paste that in there, git remote add origin, and then that basically that git address. And then um, lastly, we can then push all this code up by doing git push dash u origin main. So we just hit enter. We see that it'll basically like set a bunch of stuff up and then it just pushed. Um, and now our main branch is set up to track that remote branch in GitHub's repo. So if we go back to the browser and we just refresh this page, we'll see here is all of our, all of our code. If we click index, we should see we have our SQLize um, and bas yeah, basically just all of our code there. So we also notice that we don't have any node modules, so that git ignore works. Cool. So with that, we have um, push our code to GitHub. And in the next video, we will connect GitHub to DigitalOcean and deploy our application on DigitalOcean's uh, cloud. We're going to deploy our application to DigitalOcean's cloud. So go ahead and log, in, log into DigitalOcean, and on the left-hand side, click Apps. It'll then bring up a page um, and saying launch your app. So click that. Now we can link our GitHub account and go ahead and just choose all repositories and install and authorize it. It then takes you back to the app's home uh, and we see GitHub is a source. We can now go ahead and choose our data API repository and we can click next. And then we want to give it a name, Data API Works, choose whatever region that you're in, uh, make sure it's the main branch, and make sure we auto-deploy code changes. It automatically detected that it was a Docker file of type web service, which is awesome. And basically, we don't need to do anything except give it a run command of node index.js. And then we can click Close. We're also going to add a database. We want to add just a dev database. So we'll go ahead and add that and then we will click next. And it will go through the process. Um, oh, basic, just choose the basic size at $5 a month um, and then click launch basic app. Okay, so now it'll go through the process of creating everything um, and it'll go through and build and deploy all of our code. So what you can do is you can just sit and watch these logs. We see that it is bringing that node 14 Alpine image. It's going to run the npm install production command and it'll go through, it'll go through everything. So after some time, we should basically see that we have a deployment completed. And if we look at our deployment status, we see that it's done all the Docker file stuff and it says build complete and it's built the image to the container registry, which is great. We will then see some deploy logs, um, notably connected to database, sync to database, and then server is running with some SQL, you know, to create um, that sensor data table in our database. It will then have, if you click apps, um, it will then have this live URL, which we can click and open. Um, remember, we want to go to slash data and <laughs> it returns an empty array of data. If we go back into code, <clears throat> we can now add data with curl. So similarly, we want to do curl D um, and then the same JSON name, break room, serial one, temperature, the H content type. But instead of HTTP localhost 8080, we're going to now add our um, digital ocean address. So let's go and copy that go down to the console and paste that in. And so notice that this is HTTPS and then our URL and then slash data. And then when we submit it, it'll take a little bit longer now since we're actually posting it um, you know, to the real world um, web.
and it's now returned. And there we see we have an ID and then an updated at and created at time. If we go ahead and do another curl to post some more data, but maybe, I don't know, we change the temperature. Um, let's make the temperature 72.24 and post it. Um, we see that we get ID number two back. If we go back to our browser and refresh this, we now see that we have actual data. So at this point, um, massive congratulations because you've been able to build your own Node.js API and deploy it to DigitalOcean's cloud. Um, in the next videos, we will go through just some basic security hardening uh, and testing. And those videos are optional because, yeah, at this point, we've basically started from where we wanted to go and ended to where we wanted to be. So congrats again and um, enjoy the optional following videos. So in the following sections, um, we're going to basically harden our API a little bit. Um, we're going to install some dependencies to do that. And a couple of those dependencies are um, compression and helmet. So let's install those and use those right now. So compression and helmet. And compression will just basically make you know our requests um, s smaller to serve to the client. Um, it uses compression under the covers. And then helmet will do a bunch of cool header stuff uh, that will just make more sense and basically make our app a little bit more production ready. So we've installed those. Let's go ahead and require them. So const helmet equals require helmet, and then uh, const compression equals require compression. And then before we start our application, we can go app dot um, before the JSON, we do app.use and then helmet and make sure to invoke it. And then another app.use for compression and make sure to invoke that as well. Okay. Um, and then one thing that's very important to do with basic production applications or anything that's facing the open internet is you want to rate limit requests. So our API right now, anybody can go and just hit our API and make a bunch of requests. And basically, you know, they can grab everything and it'll be super fast. And, you know, attackers can just send tons of requests and they can also crash our server. So something that's very good practice to do is to install a rate limiter. Um, we're just going to use the express rate limit. So on their site, they on their GitHub repo, they have npm install express rate limit. So let's go ahead and install that rate limit right now. And then what we can do is we can basically use get grab their usage and use an in-memory rate limiter. Um, and so let's just go ahead and require that right now. So const rate limit equals require express rate limit. And then let's go ahead and grab their limiter. Uh, we'll make some modifications to this. So right here before defining our application, they have their rate limit um, limit to 100 requests per IP address per 15 minutes. Let's go ahead and make this one minute. So just one times 60 times 1000. And then instead of 100, let's make it 10. And so each IoT device will basically be able to send uh, 10 requests per sliding minute. Um, and then we go ahead and we're going to use this app.use limiter. And so all the all the get and the post, basically anything underneath in the code, anything underneath this limiter will use this limiter. So both the get and the posts will be rate limited to 10 requests per sliding minute. Um, so we can go ahead and save that. And if we do get status, we see that we've modified our index and our package JSON files, which is totally cool. We want to get add all and then get commit dash M. Um, and we want to say rate limit API. Usually your commit message is just something that describes um, what you've made changes to in the code. And then we can uh, push 
to the origin main branch. So git push origin main, and this will basically take all of our changes, and push them up to GitHub. And then if we go and we look at our data API application at deployments, um, we will see that a new one has just been kicked off. And we can see the details of this and it will just rebuild our Docker container and redeploy that automatically. And the super nice thing is we'll be able to see our rate limiting in action. So once this is built, let's go and look at our rate limiting in action. We were waiting on DigitalOcean to deploy our application. Once it has been deployed successfully, you will see that it has the build logs, build logs with build complete and deploy logs where everything should say connected, synced, and server is running. Um, we can now go back to our API. And if we refresh this, we get a response. And now remember, there's now that's three requests. And so once we hit 10, we should um, be rate limited. And so I'm just going to keep clicking refresh. Um, and now we see we have too many requests. Please try again later. And so this is super great because our rate limiting is working as expected. And if we keep refreshing, we'll keep seeing this too many requests. So same thing as before, if we go to curl and we try to post data to our server, um, we see that we also get this too many requests try again later. So our rate limiting is working as expected. And once that sliding minute has passed and there aren't 10 requests in that sliding minute, it'll open it back, us to, uh, back up to us. So this is great. Um, in the next video, we're going to add a basic API key detection. So requests will need this API key and we're going to use that. We're going to implement that using express middleware. So let's look at the next video. In this next section, we're going to be using express middleware to implement a basic API key detector. So let's go ahead and before our get and post request, let's do an app dot use. And you can pass any handler in here. So we're just going to use an anonymous function. Um, and this anonymous function will take a, um, a request, a response, and a next function. And then the body of the function <clears throat> will be such as this. We are going to want all requests below this to have basically a key um, in the query params. So we can do let key equals <clears throat> request dot query dot key. And basically, if there's no key or that key does not equal what we want it to be, then we want to return a 403, like uh, no permissions. So if <clears throat> no key or the key does not equal one, two, three, four, five, um, then we're going to do res dot status 403 for not um, not allowed. And we're going to send that and then we can return. And then um, basically, if they do have a key and the key is equal to one, two, three, four, five, then we can go ahead and call the next uh, function in the chain. So all the requests below will use this and calling next will just allow it to move to that next request. So this is basically like a, a blocker for, um, for everything. And so we can do that. And an, another very good thing to do at this point um, is when we make a call to get data, usually you do not want to send all your data back. You should make use of pagination where you maybe only will send 10 results back and then they can query and set an offset. So you can basically move your data, like move your window through the data. Um, because say you have a million um, pieces of sensor data in your database, you don't want to send all 1 million back to the front end, it just becomes way too much data to send back and forth. And so what we're going to basically do is we're going to grab a limit and an offset as well. And so let's say let limit equals request dot query dot limit. And we'll do an or for five. And so if there is no limit, we'll default it to five. And we're going to do the same with offset. And the default for offset should be zero. So you want to start where your starting data is. So um, 
Now we can basically pass these into our find all. And now we will default to only sending the first five back. And the, the client is responsible for incrementing this offset variable to be zero and then plus the limit and then plus the limit again and plus the limit again to uh, basically slide through all of our data. And so with this, we, um, we can now test this locally. So if your application, if your database is not running, uh, you can do docker compose up dash D to bring it up again. And then <clears throat> remember that our local, our local database isn't gonna work with this SSL. So we can just remove that for now, hit save, and then run npm run dev. And we're now connected to our local database. So when we go to our browser, localhost 8080 slash data, um, we see that we have the 403. Uh, so now if we do question mark and then key equals one, two, three, four, five, we now are allowed through. Um, so this is just, this is just great that we need that API key. Um, if we want to post data, we will also need that same key. So if you open up a second terminal and we do a curl, oh, a curl dash D to localhost dash data, um, we will see that basically nothing happens and we need to add data question mark key equals one, two, three, four, five, key equals one, two, three, four, five. And now we are able to get responses back. And so, you know, that key is required for our sensors. So each IOT device will need to know that API key in order to make, uh, to send data to our, our cloud. And then any client will need to know, know that same API key to query that data. Um, so if we, if we send a couple more, and then we go back over here and we refresh, we see that there's just five. And so if we do and limit equals 10, um, we see that we now get six back. And so the limit will be increased. We only have six total. So let's go ahead and add a few more. And then we refresh this. Oh, we've hit the too many uh, requests per second. So we can actually, we can change that since we have um, hot reloading enabled. And see now we have the limit to 10. And so if we set this limit to one, we only get one back. Um, and we can also do and, you know, offset. So we offset by 10 or we offset by one and it'll increment to the next one. So we need a key and we have a very basic pagination for getting data. In the next video, we will go over um, just some, some basic HMAC stuff, which means that our IoT devices will need a key. For our use case, we will just use a very basic key. And then um, after that, we will go through some testing, how we can run tests that will basically query our API and make sure that the responses make sense. So let's go on to the next videos. In this section, we are going to look at how we can basically add some HMAC authentication. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to define a key um, and then we're going to use the crypto library to basically use that key and the JSON body text. And we're going to sign that text to create this hexadecimal encoded um, uh, token that we're going to place into the header and then send that up to the server and then the server will also know that same key and will decrypt this token and make sure that the body of the request and the um, decrypted token are matching so um, first thing we're going to do in that terminal is let's just type node and now we're basically in a node repl environment and what we can do is we can um, require the crypto library so const crypto equals require and then crypto and then we can also um, add this into our application 
next we want to define our HMAC key. So const HMAC key. Um, it's going to be cupcakes. And then we can also add this into our application. OK, so we have crypto and we have our HMAC key. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to say let data equals some basically we're only we know we're going to send up a specific amount of JSON data. So right now we're just going to try to get that um, that token. So let's do a name break room uh, serial of zero zero one and then a uh, temperature of um, 73.1 and then we will close that off and so now if we just type data we should see that that is the uh, JSON string that that comes out um, so that's fine and then what we can do now is we're gonna create an HMAC from this data um, so let's do crypto dot create HMAC uh, the type is going to be a SHA-1. We're going to pass in our HMAC key. And we're going to up, call update with our data. And then we're going to digest with a uh, hexadecimal encoding. So just like that. And we basically, so this is a um, encrypted SHA-1 hexadecimal token. Um, so we're going to copy this and we're going to basically use this in our curl command to send that same JSON data up to our server. Um, so we can just copy this. Um, I'm just going to put it here in a comment. We can press control D to close the node REPL. And then now what we can do is the same curl data and we can add this, we basically add a new header before our localhost. Um, and right now we're just gonna have HMAC colon and then this, um, this key right there. So inside of, before sending that, um, let's go ahead and in our post, let's just try to log and see if we can find that in the header. So let's do let HMAC um, equal request dot headers and then angle bracket and a string of HMAC. And then let's just console dot log that just to verify that everything we're doing makes sense. So if we send this, um, we see that it was logged, uh, it was logged to the console. So we can successfully get that in the header, um, which is awesome. Now what we want to do is we want to basically, um, encrypt the body coming in and compare the two HMAX to see that they are equal. So let's do that. HMAC expected, um, and we we basically need the data. So let's go ahead and do crypto dot create HMAC SHA one with our HMAC key, and then we're gonna call dot update. And we need to stringify our body, so json.stringify the data. OK, um, we can actually put that on a new line. And then digest with the uh, hexadecimal encoding. OK, so we can log the HMAC, and we can um, also log the uh, HMAC expected. So let's go ahead and grab that, hit save. Um, 
And what we want to do, you hit Command K to clear your terminal. Um, we want to send the same curl. The one thing that we want to change is, I believe the temperature we set was 73, um, 73.1. Uh, not 73.0, so we just want these two strings to be equal. Okay, and on the left-hand side, we see that the HMAC is the exact same as the HMAC expected. Um, so, so that's great, because we know that we're sending the correct data. But what we want to do is we want to leverage the crypto library to basically tell us if these two are equal. Um, so let's do that hmac equal um, crypto dot, and then I believe it was timing safe equal. And we basically need a buffer. Um, so we can do a buffer dot from, and then hmac, and then a buffer dot from hmac expected. And now the crypto will give us a timing safe equal um, of true or false. And we can also um, log this. Okay. We can resend that same command. And we see that the HMAX are indeed equal. So we can now do an if statement. If they're not equal, we want to send a, um, a 403. So let's do, if they're not equal, send 403. Um, and we'll just say bad HMAC. OK. So now, if we do a curl and this HMAC, you know, basically didn't match didn't match our data, so we can either change the um, change the HMAC or change the data in this case. So if we make it 73.2, um, this HMAC shouldn't match because once we encode the string, um, it's expecting 73.1. Um, and so we see that we've basically locked up our um, server, or no, sorry, not locked up. We see that we've returned a bad HMAC, um, and so. It should be a 403, which is awesome. Um, OK, perfect. So we can go ahead and remove these console.logs and hit Save, and it will restart our application. And then if we do um, 73.1, uh, we see that we have actually executed the insert into the database, um, and we've returned back a new ID with the 73.1. So just to, just to clarify, our client, our Internet of Devices, uh, Internet of Things devices, will have to know this key. And usually it's not something like cupcakes. Usually it's a RSA encrypted, um, you know, massive long key um, with like 4096 um, characters, not just, you know, uh, the eight that we have in cupcakes. And so that key will be embedded into the hardware of the IoT devices. Um, and it should match up to be whatever your server has as well. So with this, um, we now have an HMAC requirement. Um, we can go ahead and remove this as well. And the other thing as well is this HMAC code is only added to our um, post. So the get requests for getting data will not need that HMAC key. Um, usually those will more heavily rely on having the correct API key and potentially like a user session for if you have users in your application, they'll have to log in, verify that your user is um, the correct user, and then they can query that data. So only on the post will we really want to enforce this HMAC. Um, we can enforce it on the get, but that's kind of out of the scope for, uh, for these videos. So with that, we have added all of these things. Um, before you push this code back up, make sure to undo the removal of this dialect options. 
Um, so we can stop running our application. We have undone this. And now we can do git status. Uh, we've just modified index.js. Uh, we can go ahead and do a um, git add all. Instead of doing add all, you could actually do a git add index.js and just add that one file. Um, and that would work as well because that was the only one changed. But if we do git status again, we see we've modified that. Let's commit the change. Um, adding HMAC. And then we push this to origin main. Cool. So at this point, we have a hardened, more secure API. In the next video, we will go through some basic tests where we will create a test file. Um, it'll make a bunch of requests to the server and it'll expect the server to return certain errors if there's no HMAC or API key, for example. And then it will return correct results for the um, correct HMACs and correct HPI, uh, API keys. So in that video, let's go through how to test our application. So we finally made it to the testing section. Let's just clean up a couple things. Um, right now we have our HMAC key set to cupcakes. Let's um, let's make it a potential environment variable override that defaults to cupcakes. So if we pass this in as an environment variable, it will use this. Otherwise, it will use cupcakes. And then let's also do one for our API key. Instead of hard coding it to one, two, three, four, five below, go ahead and scroll down and set the one, two, three, four, five equal to the API key. So this just gives us some more power um, where now we don't need to push code changes. Well, after this code change, we won't need to push code changes in the future if we wanted to change our API or our HMAC key. Um, also for, uh, for testing locally, we're gonna just temporarily comment out the dialect options. Um, so we won't, we won't commit that comment. Um, this should just help for uh, testing locally. So now we can go ahead and do, uh, we can install our jest and super test dependencies. So npm install dash d for development dependencies, jest and super test. And we will see that this should update our package JSON file once these have been downloaded. Um, so if we go to our package JSON and we wait for it to finish, um, we see that we have jest and super test added to our dev dependencies section. We can go ahead and remove this and make it jest. So when we run npm run test, it should just run jest. And then we need a, um, right here before the dependencies, we need to add a jest section. And this is just to like set up some stuff for jest itself. And we can basically set the test environment to, um, to node. And then we will also add a coverage path ignore pattern. And so this will just basically um, not try to do coverage compared to all the node modules. So we just want to ignore those. So coverage path ignore patterns. Um, this will be set to an array. And we definitely want the uh, node modules in this. All right, so with that, um, we should now be able to run npm run test, which will run jest, which should not find anything. Um, and that's that's okay, because we have, we have zero matches and we are currently ignoring the node modules. So now we can create a new file, call it index.test.js and we can basically go ahead and add a simple test in here. Uh, 
And so if we go to the Jest documentation, jestjs.io, and we do uh, getting started, we can just copy the basic sum test and just verify that this works. Um, we don't have a sum, but let's expect one to be one. Okay, and then we rerun npm run test and you see that it picked up our index test.js. Any test.js files will be picked up automatically um, and it passed that. So we have just set up correctly. It's ignoring node modules. In the next video, we will write basic API tests using just and super test. So let's go to the next video. To continue on with testing, we will need to make a couple changes to our index.js file. Um, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to move the server application logic into its own file and then just have the index.js file bring that in and start up the server. This will be nice because then our test file can just bring in that server code and super test can just use that server object um, without any of the other starting up boilerplate. So <clears throat> what we're going to want to do is we're first going to want to see if we are using a test environment. So let's do const node environment equals process dot environment dot node underscore env. And then if we want to, um, if we're going to start our tests, we're going to want to basically use the SQLite database. So let's do npm i dash d uh, sqlite3 and install SQLite3. And so this should download and install that dependency. And it might take some time. Um, but now what we can do is if we are in our test environment, we can start up an in-memory database. So um, node environment equals 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 um, test. Then we will do a new SQLize with a SQLite um, memory database. Okay, and I'll just place this here. All right, so if our node environment is equal to test, then we will spin up a SQLite database. Otherwise, we will connect to Postgres. Um, what we'll need to do then is in package.json, we will need to update the, um, the just command. So in test, go ahead and type Node, node underscore environment equals test, and then jest, and then at the end, let's add this dash dash silent. So update your test to look like this. All right, and now what we can do is we can, um, we can run this and make sure that dev starts back up And we see that we have an error to connect to Postgres. Um, Docker compose up dash D. And then we rerun the npm run dev. And here we see we've connected to Postgres. So, so that works. And then the other thing we will need to do is we will basically need to convert this um, to not run on the port. So we can go ahead and copy this and do a module dot exports. And we can do app and our SQLize instance. So now we will export that. We can now rename this file to app.js, update any imports, go to index. We can rename the index.test to app dot test.js and now we can go ahead and we can import our super test so let's do const request equals require super test and then we import our app in our sqlize instance so const curly brackets app sqlize equals require dot slash app 
and now we can basically add a describe. So we will describe the slash data endpoint for gets. Let's make it an async function. And then in the before all, we will want to um, create another async function and then await the SQLize authenticate and await the SQLize sync. Um, then we can go ahead and create a test um, that responds with JSON with key. Let's make it an async function. We pass this done parameter in, and then we will call request on our application dot get. You see, we have our slash data and our key is one, two, three, four, five. We set an except for application JSON. We can uh, actually do another one where we do content type. Uh, so we set the content type to application JSON as well. And then we can expect a 200 um, comma done. So let's go ahead and make a new index.js file where we import our app and our SQLize. Um, from, oh yeah, it's equal to require, equal require from dot slash app. And then what we want to do is app dot listen and we'll pass in the same um, port 8080 and then an anonymous function for the callback. So, and here we will do the try and we will do um, SQLize.authenticate and the SQLize.sync with the alter being set to true. And then we catch any errors and we can console.log that. Um, with a fail to connect to database. And then we can do a console.log server started. And we can also do a console.log here. connected to database. Okay, so this is great because now our index.js file just brings our app and our database instance. Um, we then say app.listen on that port. And we once the application is running, we try to connect to our database, whatever database that may be, the test one. Then we try to sync, um, and then we will say, you know, server has been started or not. So. If we do npm run dev, um, we see that npm run dev is still doing this database URL. That's our local post, and it's still um, calling index.js, which brings our app inside of it. And we can see that we have connected the database and that our server has started and some SQL for the alter statements. Um, we can then go and refresh this, and we have our key working and everything's fine for our local application. Um, okay, so now what we wanna do is we want to actually test our application. So before running all the tests, we will authenticate and synchronize. Um, that should then use an in-memory SQLite database because our node environment is test and we've set that node environment in our test script. So if we run npm, run test, it runs app.test.js. Awesome. Um, we have one error, and it turns out that in app.js, our SQLize for SQLite doesn't like dashes. So we can just make this table name sensor data with a capital D and remove the dash. Um, we can then rerun our tests. And we see that that test has passed. So what happened was we made a get request to slash data with our key, and it returned um, a 200. That's basically that's basically all we expected. That's all the test is doing is seeing that the response is a 200. 
we're not testing to see um, that it's an empty array or not. So if we wanted to look at how to test something else besides just the status being 200, um, we can actually go ahead and do another dot end. And this end takes an error and the response. And we can pass in a function over here. And then basically, if we do have an error, uh, what we want to do is return the done call with the error. And then if we don't, we can do another expect. And we want the um, the response uh, dot text to equal. And now we're just gonna, we know it's not this, um, but we just wanna make sure that our test makes sense. And now we can do a return done. So if we run npm run test, <clears throat> we know that the response text is actually just an empty array. Um, so we see that it actually received an empty array. And so this makes sense. We want, at this point in time, we know we don't have anything added to our application. We just want an empty array. So this test expects a 200 and it expects the response text to be equal to that empty array. So now if we run it, we should see that it passes. And that's great. So moving further, we can just copy this um, little test block. And we can basically say responds with a 403 without a key. And we can take this key out of the request. And we can expect a 403 over here. Um, and and actually, let's just run it because we'll, it'll be interesting to see what our um, response text is. Cool. And so we see that we don't actually have any response text, um, which is cool. So maybe if we go into our application and we look at that key, we can send something here like, um, you know, no API key. And now we can definitely say in our test that we would expect this to come back. And so we rerun our tests and they should both pass now. So we have one test, two tests, and they're both passing. So our application will turn a 403 without that key. Um, another thing that we can test is a 403 with, um, with a bad key. And so, you know, maybe instead of no API key, we will change this to bad API key because no API key is also a bad API key. Um, so let's go ahead and update our test to say bad API key in both cases. And let's pass an, a key, but the, let's make the key one, two, three, four, six. Um, and so now we will expect a 403 and a bad API key and a 403 and a bad API key message if there's no key. Um, so now if we run that test again, um, all three should be passing and see, we see three tests have passed. So this is just a great way to, um, like we build up a test suite around our API with expectations that we have. And then if somebody else modifies our app.js um, and it breaks these tests, they'll know that they broke our expectations of what, what we expect the code to do. Um, so this is just a good example um, of how to do that. In, I will link the source code to this whole repository where we will go in and also add a post. Um, and that post will contain the HMAC code. Uh, doing the HMAC code for the client side will really be on that IoT device. So it's kind of out of the scope of this. Um, the idea here is just to give you good uh, test testing understanding. Um, so with that, um, please look forward to the uh, source code. And thank you so much for going through all of these optional videos. So now that we have done testing, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and push all this code um, up to GitHub. And we can also go through and uncomment this dialect options 
since we're now pushing the code and make sure everything is saved. And so we have everything tested, everything's working like that. In our package file, we have a test script um, and we can actually create a GitHub action that will test our code. So let's, let's commit this. So git status is always a good starting point. We have um, added, we've modified a couple files and we've added the app.js files. Um, so let's do git add all and then git commit dash m adding tests and then we can push that git push origin main. And then this, of course, will redeploy our code in DigitalOcean. But if we go to GitHub and you just refresh, you should, you should see, um, if you go to your repositories, you should see your latest repo data API is at the top. Um, and we see that we just pushed 30 seconds ago. What we can do is we can click Actions and um, we can basically set up this Node.js workflow. And what it will do is it will run the build and then it will run npm test. And we already have that configured. So basically on push and on pull requests, um, it will grab the latest Linux Ubuntu flavor and it'll test on Node 10, 12, 14, 15. Um, so it'll pull down Node and then it'll run npm CI, which will install dependencies. It'll run a build and then it'll run npm test. So let's just see what happens if we hit start commit and we commit directly onto the main branch and we commit the new file. We see that we now have this YAML file and if we click actions, we have a Node.js CI workflow. Um, we can then drill into this and we see we have all the different jobs for the different node versions. Um, and now if we go show all versions, let's just go to node 12. This will actually check out the code that we just pushed. It will run npm CI, so it should go ahead and install um, those dependencies. And then the interesting thing is if it runs npm test, will it pass? Um, so we will basically just wait on this to happen. So now it's installing SQLite and then it will run the npm run build if the build job is present, which it shouldn't be, so then it should jump to npm test pretty quickly. Let's see if any of the other builds are doing that yet. This is also good to know just because um, various node versions might be different. You might have different results for different versions of node. So it basically just skipped over that npm run build and then it ran the npm run test. And we could see that all three have passed, which is awesome. It's exactly what we expected. And then it cleans up the job. And we see that we've passed our tests on node 10, 12, 14, and 15. So that action um, makes great sense. Um, which is super cool. So one thing that you will have to do is you have to go back into Visual Studio Code and do a git pull. And what that will do is it'll bring down that new workflow. And so if you look, it just added .github workflows. And here's the code we committed in GitHub that will run all the tests and everything. Um, so something else that is pretty cool is we should be able to create a status badge. And if you just copy this, and then we go to Visual Studio Code and we go to our README, we can paste this right under our heading, uh, save it, do git add all uh, git commit dash m adding build badge and then git push origin mart, uh, main. And so this will push this 
um, badge up to our repository. And now if we go and we click the main code, um, we see that we have no JS CI is passing. So you'll be able to see just on here when you push commits in that you're passing or not. And then as we would expect in DigitalOcean, it is building and going to redeploy our API. Um, so at this point, I think we're at a pretty good stage to finishing everything up. Um, we've cleaned a lot. Everything's pushing and deploying correctly and being tested in the cloud. Uh, so you don't have to run these tests locally. You can just have GitHub run those. And yeah, we've come to the end. So I just want to thank everybody for watching and for taking this course. Um, and thank you specifically for sticking through these optional um, videos.